Hello, welcome to the Smarter Tech Podcast. My name is Nick Pino, the EMF guy. I'm here with Arthur Menar, who is the co-founder and CEO of LAMS. Uh, Arthur, welcome to the Smarter Tech. I'm really happy to have you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me again, Nick. Uh, yes, excited and, uh, for the second conversation. Yeah, exactly. A second conversation. And, and everyone who uh, might have been following me for that long, on October 7th, 2020, uh, almost three years ago as we're recording this, uh, episode number 28, that's going to be in the show notes. And the podcast used to be audio version, so there's no video version. But I, I do recommend diving into that conversation where we kind of started talking about the benefits of EMF blocking underwear. But... Uh, uh, lately, uh, Arthur and I had a great discussion just privately where he shared with me many interesting developments, uh, both with uh, the company LAMS, but also the studies around EMF blocking clothing, which I think make it more make the entire topic more credible um, in, in my mind. So there's many things that happen also on the scientific side that we're going to discuss. So I'm very excited for this conversation. Uh, maybe the first thing I want to dive into is uh, how has your personal understanding of the dangers of EMFs uh, evolved uh, if, if it has changed in the last three years since we last talked? Um, it has actually, um, and I think I'm not the only one uh, yeah. who's in this case because the the research has uh, kept progressing as well, um, and it's been pretty fascinating to see the progress that has been made. Uh, even I mean, in the last decade, uh, and and especially in the last few years, and I think now we're starting to be at a point where we understand better. Uh, or at least there is a main theory that, that has emerged with regards to the biological mechanism by which EMF uh, can have a uh, cellular, uh, can, can create cellular stress and cellular damage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think understanding this, and we can we can dive into it or, or not, uh, I'm always happy to get nerdy on biology, <laughs> yeah. um, but um, understanding this also really helps uh, understand why uh, EMF can cause oxidative stress, can cause inflammation, and ultimately is linked with so many different uh, ailments like cancer, like fertility issues, uh, like hormonal uh, disruption, and and so on and so forth. Because at the end of the day, if you look at inflammation, if you look at in, uh, oxidative stress, it is the root cause of a lot of today's modern diseases um, uh, since we since we live so long. Exactly. And I think that a lot of people have been um, kind of stuck in this rut when it comes to EMF health effects and especially those that are skeptical about, OK, well, is this really a big deal? We're uh, exposed to the sun, for example, all the time. That's the one I, I hear a lot from engineers, from skeptics. But the scientific studies show that when you use artificial EMFs, it's kind of a completely different deal than the natural EMFs. And it doesn't have, uh, it's not just about the intensity of the signal. Yeah. It looks like even minute changes in both uh, you know, oxidative stress, but also uh, other things that are happening at a cellular level can impact certain parts of the biology. One of it could be brain health, but also sperm quality. And I want to dive into it because uh, in early January, uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman, who has a massive following online, he's a, a neuroscientist at Stanford. He's very influential. He's on Joe Rogan. It seems like uh, every other week these days, it's, he's always <laughs> there and talking about all sorts of Topics, but he did an episode on EMS, a brief um, question and answer. And I paid 10 bucks to be part of his premium membership just to make sure to get it as his answer. And basically, he said, and he, that's something he also publicly stated on, on Twitter, that in his mind, the data on cell phones and pockets and testosterone and also the loss of fertility, it is more convincing in his view than BPA and other, you know, endocrine disruptors that we get in the environment in the form of plastics. And uh, to me, it was a very, very bold statement to make. I was surprised by that. So did you see, as far as, as you're concerned, I, I know that there's a lot of data that came out about fertility, but it's kind of confirming what we already knew, right? There's a lot of action in science kind of proving these impacts 
impacts on fertility. Have you come across any anything lately? Yeah, and that's actually the main uh, the main reason why Andrew started. Um, well, looking into it in the first place yeah. was uh, that this, the research has, has kept evolving in, in the past few years as well. And particularly in 2021, in November, um, there was a meta study publi- uh, published reviewing uh, 18 recent studies on the effect of fel- uh, cell phone usage on sperm quality. Uh, and specifically looking the non-heat related effects. Yeah. Um, and because... Uh, for those who are listening and don't necessarily uh, are, are not necessarily aware of all the weeds, mm-hmm. um, EMF uh, are non-ionizing radiation, uh, which is different from uh, ultra uh, from uh, X-rays or uh, gamma radiation, which are powerful enough to knock out an electron from your DNA straight away and 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 create cancer and help or contribute to uh, cancer that way. With EMF, they are not powerful enough to do this, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're harmless because they still have uh, can have a biological effect on our body. Uh, again, like increasing oxidative stress and, and, and inflammation. Um, but it was when cell phones came out, it was assumed that outside of a, an increase in heat, uh, the EMF would not have any of those biological effects. And so, looking at fertility specifically, and we uh, and a number of studies have looked at other areas as well. Um, what they found is that uh, independently of the heat created by the cell phone, uh, cell phone usage does correlate with lower sperm count, um, significantly lower sperm quality. Um, so we're talking about morphology, we're talking about lifespan, uh, we're talking about speed, which are all very important um, uh, criteria for sperm to be e- efficient. Uh, and finally, uh, there is a um, there is clear evidence of strong DNA damage when exposed to EMF, and that came out in 2019 uh, in a over 10 years, 30 million dollar study by uh, the NTP, which is the uh-huh. National Toxicology Program, um, headed. Uh, it's it's part of the uh, health department here in in the US. And um, and which was done on rats and again showed a clear evidence of uh, DNA damage. And so when you take this into sperm, uh, not only is sperm count and sperm quality affected, uh, but there is a higher likelihood of seeing DNA defects on the sperm that is left. Um, and all of this is very concerning when you look at sperm. Because in the last um, in the last twenty years since the year two thousands, we've been as men losing about two point six percent of our fertility every year. Um, so it's if crazy. That, if that trend were to continue, um, we'd all become sterile by roughly two thousand and sixty. Yeah, um, it's it's completely mad. And I, I saw, as always, there's always arguments. So, you know, uh, it's, oh, no, the data is, isn't correct and whatnot. But mostly I see scientists that I trust uh, agreeing with that and saying, we've got a problem. And it's surely not, um, uh, you know, EMF is surely not the only reason oh, that well, sure uh, we're, we're, we're never arguing that. And I guess some people on the internet may be uh, kind of, uh, showed the data that way. And, oh, EMFs, you know, is a root cause of everything that's happening in the world. I don't agree with that. And if anything, there's also, you know, uh, the plastics and endocrine disrupting agents, including also certain classes of pesticides, if I uh, recall correctly. So there's a lot of environmental toxicants that might be at cause or at play. And even there's, it goes even deeper than that. And we don't simply don't have the data, but there's even synergistic effects and uh, potentially, you know, um, multiplicating effect between different environmental toxins. So who knows exactly what's happening all we know is it's plausible that the cell phone is having an impact when we test it on rats or on sperm directly or even look at human populations the data is there and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger and also on testosterone so that's another thing uberman said and i think it's Mm -hmm. it it deems to be repeated 
if you do not want to conceive, you already have kids or, you know, you got snipped and now you have no intention of, you don't care about your sperm quality. In other words, well, let's talk about testosterone because Huberman also said, and this is something, you know, I've been researching it uh, as a, as a curious guy, a citizen journalist, if you will, for seven years, the topic of EMFs. And I did not think that the data on testosterone was so strong, but according to him, it is a major factor. He said, if you want to optimize your testosterone, do not keep a phone in your pocket. What about the data on testosterone? Have you also seen that uh, move in the last years? Is there, I know that Huberman thinks so, but I'm very curious to see um, how strong the data is because it could convince a lot of people that are not interested in, in conceiving, like young men, teenagers. You know, they're not interested in having babies yet. They're in the early 20s. They're like, oh no, that's for later. But their testosterone, oh my God, do not touch their testosterone because they hold to that for their, their life, right? And they, li they like to see high levels of testosterone and manliness. So it could be a big argument for them to look into prudent avoidance or even, you know, wear the box or the things like that. Yeah. Um, so with testosterone, um, it's interesting because most people don't necessarily know what testosterone is uh, contributing to. Um, because it's, it's actually one of our most important hormones, um, as men, um, mm -hmm. and it plays a key role in our reproductive health, um, which might explain potentially, um, I can't decide that he wants to be part of that conversation, <laughs> no <worries. laughs> um, <laughs> which, uh, uh, which potentially might explain also the, the impact on our sperm quality, et cetera. Um, but it also impacts our bodily function. Uh, and so uh, in 2021, again, another systematic review has looked at the impact on the EMF on the endocrine uh, system, which is the system that regulates our hormones and particularly on testosterone. And so again, uh, looking, I don't have the number of studies off uh, the top of my head that they ended up looking at, um, but doing a systemic review uh, of uh, the, all the recent uh, studies, uh, they found that uh, there was, again, a significant correlation between uh, EMF exposure and lower testosterone, which lower testosterone can lead then to decreased libido, to reduce muscle mass and bone density, to hair loss, and as we mentioned before, increase risks of reproductive problems. So this can affect any man, <laughs> Uh, we yeah. care about, uh, any of those four, um, any of those four things. Uh, and, and so it's not just for a uh, reproductive problem. And it's, it's funny that you're saying that you're mentioning youngsters because I've, I've had in conversations before with regards to keeping your cell phone in your pocket. Um, and when talking about the boxer, some people being like, oh, well, perfect. Let me put three of slash three of them in my pocket. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, help with, uh, uh, with birth control. First of all, I don't think this is the most effective birth control mechanism out there. Let's put it, uh, let, let's be clear. But, uh, but on top of this, yeah, it, uh, I, I, based on the study and the data, the studies and the data that is out there, um, it it's not just our reproductive system. It's also testosterone, which can have a big impact on the rest of our, um, quality of life. Yeah. And it's important to mention also from my understanding, testosterone is very key in women as well. Although the levels are, are dramatically lower than in men, if my understanding is correct, but it is also essential for their sexual health, libido. And, uh, if, if, women have zero testosterone, for example, which happens in certain women, they have a completely disrupted hormonal uh, cycle or hormonal balance. So it, it's also important to mention that it's not just about men. And yeah. the reason that we have fewer studies on women is that sperm is very easy and cheap to study. That's what I learned from fertility research and he hearing some of these interviews. Uh, basically, you can have volunteers. It's if, not to be gross here, but it's easy to extract. It's renewable. It's it's easy to study. Whereas if you study women fertility, well, you have to do more rat studies. And we're talking about looking at the egg quality and different. Like it requires a lot more manipulations. So I think that the costs are are tremendously higher for 
female fertility. But it needs to be said and repeated that, you know, a phone in the pocket for women is likely not better. If anything, it could be worse because you do not regain your fertility as mm -hmm. a woman if it's been damaged, so so to speak. Uh, so men can renew their uh, their sperm reserves in you know a few weeks to a few months, and the damage is kind of undone, if you will. But for women, they get one set of eggs from their the start of their very existence until death. So. I, I know that some researchers have said around EMS, like you, Taylor, from from Yale for years, that in women, it's equally, you know, it's equally a concern. It's just that we have even less data. So in a sense, it's it's more concerning since we don't have the data to to kind of rule that out. Yeah, there are, um, you know, it's if you look at scientific research and um and uh, it's changing in, in recent years, but for the most part, uh, <laughs> you see the impact of, of sexism in scientific research as well. Most of the research uh, that has been that has been conducted on a number of things, and that includes EMF, has been done on men. Uh, sometimes because it is more convenient for fertility, and other times uh, simply because that's how we've been doing things is studying what it does on men and then assuming that it translates to, to, to women. Um, yeah. and so with fertility, obviously, as you said, it's a lot more complex to go and study the effect on, on eggs that you need to extract over, uh, looking at, uh, you know, an in vitro study of like two tubes of sperm, one with a cell phone next to, to, to the other and, or, you know, collect a number of samples of men at different point in time. Um, and so, um, the, on the, on the bright side, with regards to women, the ovaries are inside of their body. Um, so there is a yeah. little more tissue in between the eggs themselves uh, and uh, and your cell phone. And, and this tissue is going to absorb um, some of the EMF before it reaches it. So the, ex the amount of exposure to EMF is not going to be as important as, um, as for men where uh, our reproductive organs are literally sitting outside of our body. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact. <laughs> and uh, to this day, we actually don't know what amount is too much versus, you know, uh, completely, completely harmless. If there is an amount of exposure that is harmless, um, we understand uh, that they the exposure to emf can activate some of our signaling pathways in our cells membranes mm -hmm. uh, those signaling pathways being uh, activated by electrical currents and um, emf are made out of a electromagnetic field and so they may trigger some of our signaling pathway without our body necessarily needing the signaling pathway to be uh, triggered now cascading into a number of reactions, which again lead to oxidative stress, which lead to cellular stress, cellular damage, uh, and, and DNA damage. Um, and so if those eggs, as you said, um, are exposed to this type of damage, especially DNA damage, there is no renewal, um, mechanism and, uh, there is nothing that can be done to, uh, counter that damage. Um, for men, there is any damage that is done on sperm today, um, spermatogenesis is less about three months. Uh, so in three months, you would in theory regain uh, your fertility. Now this is with assuming that no damage was done on the organs themselves that produce the sperm, and that, which you know mm. is is another uh, good point. It, it is another discussion. And similarly, uh, we don't know exactly how long it would take before uh, the testosterone levels go back to normal, which themselves impact your fertility. So it's a little more, com uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that like, if you stop wearing your, yourself in your pocket and three months, you're back to normal. Uh, mm. there might be more processes that are involved in this and especially, and, and now we're getting into the nitty gritty, but, um, if you look at the endocrine si uh, system, a lot of our hormones are by your brain. Um, and so there is, uh, a number of crossovers between, you know, our 
organic uh, or, or different bodily functions and organs, etc. And so that's why uh, you know uh, this exposure to EMF uh, in certain areas of our body can impact other. And that's not because, um, and and that's because you have all this crossover of um, of uh, a bodily function. Yeah, this is this is a great point uh, where you could have exposure to the head, and then you know an endocrine effect that could be uh, for your entire body, for example. But I want to make sure to switch gears here and and address the the clothing. We did talk about it about three years ago, but. Um, something you shared with me is that you now have more data. Uh, you've teamed up with uh, Aura Ring and uh, poss possibly other companies. And correct me if I'm wrong, but anyway, I wear Aura. It might be also other. Okay, there you go. So um, um, one colleague wrote to me this morning, asked me, Nick, are you promoting you know, a wireless device? No, Aura Ring is uh, one of the companies I, I, I love because as a wearable, it can store the data locally so you can keep it on airplane mode. So a lot of people ask me this question and I'll I'll put it on the forefront or else people will write in the comments, what, <laughs> what are you doing, right? I, I don't advocate for Bluetooth use and I'm, I'm it's kind of one, one of my pet peeves. I, I, I wouldn't really, if someone gifted me a Bluetooth something, I would likely try to sell it and then say, sorry, you know, I just don't wear that. It's kind of a, a principle of mine, if you will. I try to walk my talk. I don't think it would make sense for a DMF guy to kind of have a Bluetooth thing 24-7 <laughs> in his bed. So no, I'm not doing that. So for, for Aura, which is a sleep tracking device, but also a health tracking device, because it gives you markers uh, of recovery and the, the health of your nervous system, such as HRV, which is heart rate variability. Uh, can you talk about what results you've seen when people wear different types of clothing and maybe just a reminder of what lambs is and what kind of products you guys do because uh, i think this is kind of a, a response to these health effects that we're seeing from phones and uh just just to say because again some people like to to kind of look at every word I say, of course, in a perfect world, we would all stop putting the phone in the pocket. But if you look at scientific studies, and if I look at the average citizen, it's probably at least half men that have it nearly 24 seven in their pocket. And when it's not in the pocket, it's under the pillow. So the reality <laughs> is the sobering reality is everyone's doing it or so many people, and maybe they need, you know, help, and tools that will help them. So that's why I like the idea of LAMS personally. Yeah, I appreciate it, Nick. And actually, that's why we created uh, LAMS in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you if you look at the backstory behind LAMS, um, I was actually working on uh, studying uh, can the prostate cancer back then. Uh, that was uh, I was working in genomics, looking at the genetic causes of this cancer, which led me down this path. But um, one day at dinner with friends, we all um, put our cell phones on the table and we started that discussion of, well, we've heard about the fact that we shouldn't have it in our pockets and yet here it is. Um, and especially as men, when we're, we're, the majority of us don't necessarily carry a purse or something, um, that's yeah. kind of the only place where you can carry your cell phone that is convenient because if you uh, look at the average number of times someone checks their phone during the day, um, I don't know if it's evolved, but a few years ago, it was two to 300 times a day. Yeah. Um, and so you're not going to put it in a backpack and, and, and walk around with yourself in the backpack. Um, and on top of this, there is also the reality that, you know, if you live in a city, um, I've got 24 Wi-Fi. I'm exposed to 24 Wi-Fi currently at the office. It's 43. Um, there is, so it's not just, and then, and then some of these devices are actually also convenient. Um, like if you get into your car, uh, your phone will likely sync with your car in Bluetooth, unless you deactivate Bluetooth in your, yeah. um, in, in your, on, on your phone, but then I'm not sure all you can deactivate Bluetooth in all cars. So the, the point being there is. There is one option, which is moving to the woods. <laughs> and then uh, there's another option, which is trying to limit our exposure. And with LAMPS, what we've tried to do is provide a solution that helps limiting the exposure whilst minimizing the lifestyle changes that one has to do. 
Um, so I still advocate against wearing wireless uh, earbuds. Oh, we definitely can't help with that. And I always go for corded. Um, but otherwise, we've created clothing that blocks 90, over 99.7% of all EMF um, from reaching our essential organs. And so we've created, uh, you know, T-shirts, uh, hoodies, underwear, hats. Um, and the way we've done our product development is looking at what are the most impacted organs uh, and how can we uh, how can we protect them? And um, the second piece of of lamps that you mentioned was the impact on heart rate variability and sleep score, uh -huh. uh, and that's been probably the most important interesting development that we've seen in in the recent years. Um, we've done a number of studies. Uh, we started with a lab study where we uh, essentially measured the difference in heart rate variability. Uh, with someone using a cell phone who was controlled environment where that was the only source of EMF around, um, of someone using a cell phone with and without wearing a lamb's t-shirt, uh, we also have a gator. Uh, so the person was wearing the t-shirt and the gator uh, during that study. Um, and what we found in 100% of the subjects uh, doing that test, so again, with no other sources of EMF um, otherwise, uh, is that um, when wearing lambs, we've seen an improvement on HRV, heart rate viability, of 18% on average. Why does it matter? Um, HRV is um, heart rate viability. We can, it's the average um, time difference between your uh, each of your heartbeats. When mm -hmm. you've got a 60 BPM heartbeat, you actually your heart doesn't beat every second. Uh, it actually has like, it will be 0.8 second and then 1.2 and then 1.3 and then 0.7. And the average is gonna make it uh, one second, but um, the heart rate variability is the average time difference between those heartbeats. And if you have a high, high heart rate viability, that means that your autonomic nervous system uh, is well balanced between your fight or flight response and your rest and digest response. If you have a lower HRV, that means that likely your re your fight or flight mechanism, uh, your fight you're in a state of fight or flight, um, which is great if you're uh, hunting, uh, if you're escaping a lion, um, or if you're you know running a marathon. Uh, it's not if you're just going about your day, because that means that your body is going to prioritize certain functions, um, such as, um, you know, like dilating your pupils uh, and um, oxygenation of your muscles, et cetera, which helps you survive. Um, whereas in rest and digest, uh, all of your normal body functions uh, for well, resting and digesting uh, are being activated. And so what we're, what we're seeing is that when wearing lambs, um, people and exposed to EMF, people see a, re a cardiac response, uh, which indicates that their body is um, in a state that favors recovery uh, and favors digestion uh, and essentially favors uh, all of your body function instead of uh, of being under the stress associated with the CMF source, assuming this is the, the stress, uh, the, the stressor, which based on the studies is likely the reason behind it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this is not in electro sensitives, right? Because I know yes. researchers that look specifically at at least self-reported electrosensitivity where people say, oh my God, I'm so affected by my phone. I get brain fog or I get heart palpitations or I know I'm electrosensitive. We're not talking about these. We're talking about healthy individuals that yes. don't really feel anything. So again, it, it bears repeating because a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm not sensitive. So I'm not that impacted. I don't see the difference. Your body knows the difference. At least, you know, your nervous system does. And what is an 18% difference? Well, over time, it might be substantial in how, how calm you feel. And you, you know, we're not talking about necessarily avoiding disease, although, you know, shielding your fertility is, is kind of avoiding certain problems, maybe fertility problems or low testosterone or whatnot, but it's not even that it's, you know, 
being the healthiest you can. So in my mind, an improvement of HRV is just an improvement of quality of life overall. So that's quite profound. Yeah. The, on, on top of, first of all, you nailed it right on the head when you, you talked about the healthy individuals, uh, people who are not, I mean, uh, people who are not suffering from extra sensitivity. Um, and we actually went a step further and uh, did a, uh, a crowdfunding study on our uh, on our um, customer base um, for anyone who had a an wearing specifically, and looking at the difference between the data before they started wearing lamps and then the data after they started wearing lamps. So if you do that with one individual, that's not going to be representative because you have the lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. When you do this on a cohort on a big cohort of individual. Uh, you can see a pretty strong correlation. And in our case, we've got 78% uh, of our customers who saw a difference on their health tracker, either on HRV or on sleep quality the moment they started wearing lamps. And what's beautiful is for the sleep quality, the people who saw, who had the highest likelihood of seeing it were people sleeping with lamps, but even people wearing lamps during the day saw an impact on their sleep during the night, which makes sense. Um, cause I mean, a number of things can impact your sleep. And, and, and again, if we look at rest and digest versus, uh, fight or flight, this is definitely something that, that would have an impact. Um, and sleep is by far the most important biological phenomena by which we're, uh, recovering by which we're, uh, improving our brain by which our, it, it impacts our mood. Uh, I mean, sleep essentially impacts just about <laughs> everything that matters. Um, yeah. and so, I mean, uh, yeah, brain function, cognitive performance, metabolic and hormonal regulation, uh, cardiovascular health, even mood and anxiety. Yeah. Um, blood sugar. So, I mean, it's everything. It's everything. Yeah. People that are sleep deprived. I, I was um, listening to Uberman again with colleagues. I don't recall who it was. They, they talked about sleep depriv deprivation and, you know, the risk associated with sleep deprivation. It's, I think it's one of the most dangerous activities we know of kind of the, in the mm -hmm. long term is Absolutely. not sleeping enough for decades. It's kind of one of the worst habits. I think it, it, it beats, you know, it, it must be more dangerous than smoking, uh, in, in the data, I think like, like oh, sleeping yeah. four hours per night, imagine, or even, you know, night shift work, which is another very unfortunate reality for a lot of hard workers and God bless them. But yeah, it's, it's something very, very difficult for the body to, to cope with. At least if you're a night worker, you can, I guess, manage a sleep schedule where you get more than four hours, hopefully, but some people just on purpose barely sleep and they're always busy, you know, and working 18, 18 hour days. I, I was there years ago, so I'm not judging, but it's not something healthy to do. So when it comes to those studies though, uh, did, did you differentiate between the cap, the shirt, the boxers, or do, do we know which one, you know, has a stronger impact? So we did not, um, okay. and uh, simply because we had too much variability. I mean, we did in the lab study that I was talking about in which during which we wore the gator and uh, the t-shirt. That was the only two products that were being worn and the cell phone was being held like they were watching a YouTube video okay. um, or making a phone call. We we experimented with different types of, of emission. Uh, we did. And during for for the non lab study, um, we essentially like our customers were wearing a, a variety of different combination of lamps clothing. And that's where, uh, it, it's harder for us to differentiate, which has the biggest effect. We will get there at some stage. Um, you know, like it's not, it's just the beginning of our foray into like studying the impact of, of wearing lamps. Um, what I would say is, you know, each of our products have been designed in order to shield specific organs and each of these organs have a more or or less of an impact on on specific body functions. So if you look at you, you were talking about blood sugar and uh, metabolism uh, in in general uh, is mostly being controlled by our thyroid, which is a little gland that is uh, located right here, as well as our brain, which controls our thyroid. Um, so if you are taking care of your thyroid health uh, as well as your brain health, this is where you're going to see the, the, the 
most effect on your metabolic health uh, generally. And so uh, we've created a thyroid gator uh, and we've got the hats or the beanies um, that help with the brain. And most likely this would be the two products that would help the most with um, shielding your metabolic health long-term. But again, because of what we discussed before, uh, the human body is a very complicated machine. Yes. <laughs> so there is a lot of different interactions that can happen um, between different organs. And on top of this, what I do want to touch on uh, is that it is, is something that you said at the beginning, which I thought was very interesting, which is uh, there is likely a combination between the effect of EMF uh, as well as other environmental toxins. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at, again, the, 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 uh, what EMF has been associated with neurological disorder, car cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, and poor sleep quality, memory, et cetera, you're like, well, they're, it's essentially the root cause of everything. <laughs> again, that's not true that it's contributing to all of this, but each of us individually will have a different a different reaction to emf based on what's happening in our body too so someone who might you know have a more sensitive uh, blonde brain barrier for x y or z reason might have more of an effect on neurological disorders and or cognitive function when exposed to emf someone who has more of a gut uh, or originally gut problems that might exacerbate those problems. And so we're seeing even in our customer base, a number of people are like, this is interesting that helped me with that, but I don't understand why. Um, and, and sometimes, I mean, it, you know, it, it might not be related at all. Um, but oftentimes what you find is that, yes, there is a link between A and B uh and and if a was already sensitive then you're more likely to to develop b and so um the long the long story short being yeah you and i uh, are not going to have the same uh, effect long term of emf exposure um and you know you might start i might strap three phone around my head and and be totally fine in seven years from now and uh and whereas you could use your phone normally and 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 be more likely to develop brain cancer um, it's just like with smoking, uh, you've got people smoking every day who end up living till 95 and never having a single lung problem. But the reality is it does increase your risk of developing these lung problems. Um, but yeah. the rest of your lifestyle matters as well. So if you're going to McDonald's every day, um, maybe EMF is not that big of a problem because you're already doing something that is and, and sleeping four hours a night, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, you're, uh, it's it's an overall lifestyle, uh, like living a, a healthy lifestyle is is overall what, in my opinion, matters at the end of the day. Yeah, and you know, controlling the frequencies we're exposed to, I think that increasingly it's perceived as less and less of a crazy idea, especially since this uh, the blue light researchers or those who cite blue light, including Huberman, but including many other scientists, uh, Professor Sachin Panda, for example. There's several scientists in sleep research that that talked, of course, about the light we're exposed to. But some of these scientists are starting to understand that invisible signals also matter because you know we don't have the eyes to perceive okay that mm -hmm. okay well there's blue light from my screen uh, and even if we don't have the eyes to perceive we have receptors on our cell on the mitochondria that do perceive so in the end is it really that different well i think that it's even sneakier of an <laughs> of an exposure in a sense when it's invisible because our senses are not really telling us what's happening except in a, in some individuals that have these electro sensitivities and they can tell very well and that of course is not proven but i have enough people in my circles that i can tell you I'm, i i do find it extremely credible that some people are able to feel the signals quite rapidly even though well, they, they did try to do experiments and whatnot and it's it's inconclusive the reality is you know i talk to these doctors that are treating such patients and some patients can feel a phone at several feet when it's on when it's off and they can they can tell for sure uh, i do not wish that degree of sensitivity on anyone by the way uh it must be yeah. horrible. 
no, I 100%, especially in this world where, again, you're exactly. permanently exposed to EMF, whether you want it or not, If you live, especially if you live in a city. You yeah. just don't have a choice. Your neighbors are going to have Wi-Fi. Most of our appliances even are becoming connected nowadays. And mm-hmm. um, and on, on electricity and CDVD, it is becoming more and more of an accepted um, disease um, by the medical community. And if you look at the World Health Organization, they actually published an article about this uh, pretty recently, um, where um, where they say that there is a potential for EMF to become a significant global health problem. Um, and it's estimated today that about 4% of the population um, is has some degree of electrosensitivity. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the... The, the amount to which if you have a phone near you, you can't function anymore, um, but that you're getting some effect like headaches, um, for instance, when uh, exposed to EMF radiation. And a lot of people might not know necessarily that they're, you know the headaches that they're feeling on a regular basis are potentially um, uh, are, are potentially the, their body's reaction to EMF exposure. Um, but that's, yeah, uh, that's about the, the percentage of the population that is estimated today uh, to be electrosensitive. And again, this is a very new field of study and we don't, uh, like, we don't really know. Uh, if you, if you go back 20 years ago, we thought, uh, smartphones were, to- um, cell phones were totally safe. And, uh, today the, the overwhelming majority of scientists who've worked on the question are saying, mm, yes, no, it has a biological effect for sure. Now, how yeah. bad will it be in 30 years? That's the question that no one has the answer to. Um, but personally, I'm not willing to be the guinea pig that is going to discover that for myself. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, exactly. So I guess it's a matter of there. there's maybe different people that would be a good fit for lambs. If you're trying to be at your absolute best, you're an athlete and you have the budget for it, you're like, okay, well, uh, screw it. I'm going to just add something and see if it works or not. That's fine. In your case, you're already extremely healthy, extremely optimized, and maybe you sleep very well. Maybe you want to add, you know, the boxers. It's in my, in my case, Um, I don't have a very large degree of sensitivity, if any, anymore. Uh, I've, I've had a tremendous year. I sleep well, I have a plenty of energy, but I need to change my boxers. They're old. They don't look good. I won't talk about it more, but, uh, I need to replace them. Right. So I'm like, okay, I need to replace them. They don't look good. What the hell is this? So I'm going to replace them with limbs because to me, I know that there are studies showing a reduction in um, in fertility, even at levels that are considered background in some cities. So that's something to be said also, because we do we do know or there is it's very plausible that acute exposure like a phone that is very strong, you know, strong signal right next to, you know, to your your gonads is not good. And it's probably leading to the highest effects. But it could also be that environmental exposure to EMFs in the form of just your freaking neighbor has a Wi-Fi or even the mm-hmm. cell towers could also have an impact. Um, scientists do t- do think that. I, I'm, I'm thinking about bioinitiative report, for example, and they, they kind of looked at, okay, well, what levels would be deemed quote unquote safe where we don't think there's going to be biological effects. And these levels are so like orders and orders of magnitude lower than the average exposure I'm getting in a city. So imagine the reality is we don't know to what extent, you know, where's, where's the the threshold Uh, exactly. As you said, we don't know. So you can use it as prevention. I know that, and I have to say that as part of my work, because there there are many people that are electrosensitive that are following me. Some people that are electrosensitive love the EMF blocking clothing. Uh, For some people, they told me it changed my life. It made me much more capable of coping with exposures doesn't mean they expose themselves more, but if they have to go to the grocery store and even in the grocery store, there's a strong Wi-Fi for customers. I can handle it and I don't feel buzzed or something like that. I had electrosensitives tell me I didn't feel good with the clothing. So in that case of electrosensitivity, it's so, it, it should be 
you know, something that is individuality, uh, like that is based on your individual biology. So if it worked for someone else, it may work for you, but maybe not. And as far as I'm concerned from EMF aware doctors that are treating electrosensitives, some of them are using clothing also in their medical practice and seeing good results and others prefer not to. So it's very unclear what really, how this could be used in a medical setting. So for electrosensitive, unfortunately, I don't have the answers. We don't have the studies about EMF blocking clothing, but I think it's, I think it's a good idea to experiment with them because some people found that it does give them relief. So why not, right? Why not try it? I think it's worth trying it. But for preventative measures, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense. If you are spending a lot of time in an electropolluted environment, you're cleaning up your own home, but there are other exposures. Does it make sense to wear the boxers or maybe the shirt or other modalities from time to time or or or, or all the time for that matter? I, I think that the net benefit might be positive, a positive one. But again, uh, let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, Archer, I, I sorry to go on a long rant here. I want to I wanted to give some context, and it's kind of it, it's one of this, those topic EMF blocking clothing that for years since I released my book seven years ago, I'm getting like it's like controversy and controversy. Some researchers say, oh no, avoid them altogether, the clothing. Some doctors see, say, no, 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 you should wear it all the time. So I'm torn and torn and torn. But at this point, I think, I think it does more good than harm, especially the boxers. And I would love to see large scale studies on wearing the boxers, you know, every day and things like that. Are you guys working on something like that, especially for fertility? Because if if you do find results, you know, in the future, maybe they're going to, I don't know, sub, the government's going to subsidize them or something because <laughs> it's a big problem that fertility drop in the population. So we actually have something uh, and we're, uh, we, we, we've got something planned and we're exploring currently a partnership with a governmental arm and I can't really tell more than that because it's very, very much the nascent nice. uh, stages right now. Uh, on uh, on a larger scale, if, uh, on, on studying some of the effect of lambs on on um, on our on our body functions, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at at, at that. But um, uh, one thing that I do want to address because you, you you mentioned how there was this split between people who uh, who recommend uh, EMF blocking clothing and people who don't, and I and yeah. I. I've, I've heard this um, a number of times, obviously, running lambs. And I think um, the first thing that, I, that, that I'll say is that when uh, looking at EMF blocking clothing before we started lambs, um, a lot of the products that existed um, on the market were claiming to block EMF, um, but actually what they were um, doing was either use a patch um, of, and, and this is still the case today, uh, a patch of fabric that might be EMF blocking um, on a surface that is not big enough uh, or who, which simply did not block the frequencies. We, we tested a, a number of them uh, when we came up with our technology. And so what's extremely important when looking at blocking EMF is understanding that number one, you can't block EMF straight from the device um, because your e devices are using EMF to communicate wirelessly. Yeah. So if you were blocking EMF, say with a cell phone case, for instance, your cell phone would not work anymore. Um, or at least you wouldn't be getting any calls, any text, or any cellular reception. And so when understanding this, we realized that the only thing we can really shield is our body. And the way to do this is not just create this material here that we've created, that, that, that we've invented, which is made out of 42% silver fiber. And the silver fiber is weaved into a specific grid that acts as a, similarly to a Faraday cage and has electromagnetic shielding properties. Um, but this is not enough. This grid essentially needs to cover a uh, surface big enough around the organs that you're trying to cover in order to create this Faraday cage effect. If you were to use too little of it, 
um, what can happen is an antenna effect, which essentially will mm. attract more of the EMF in that specific region. So let's take the underwear, for instance, if we were to just create the pouch using our fabric, that yeah. would probably increase the amount of EMF, whereas we are actually using our fabric all around. And so why, why do I mention this on like, you might say, well, then just use the fabric everywhere in the products. And that's what we're doing. But to give you an idea, our fabric costs about as much to produce as cashmere. Um, and so it would be very easy to go about uh, cutting costs and, and saying, well, we're going to put, you know, the fabric on the front or like right on the heart or around the organ that matters. And that's where you might see these effects of, well, I don't feel good when I'm wearing DMF blocking clothes because the clothes have not been designed with uh, this fact in mind. And so when you want to look at EMF blocking clothing, you need to be looking at clothing that has been, well, first of all, created with, with a technology that actually works and that is certified. And second of all, that is embedded at 360 degrees around clothing that has been tested on human phantoms, which are uh, mannequins that reproduce the um, physical and chemical properties of a human body. And that's what we do here at LAMS. Whenever we test new products, we make sure that um, whatever is protected by the product uh, is effectively getting protected and, and that we don't have an antenna effect. Yes. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's not at the same time, right? Test your product to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. It's so obvious, but many people don't understand that in many industries, there are there are corners that are cut left and right and i'm talking about some lambs competitors random products on amazon and i don't mm -hmm. I particularly love amazon there are some good products in there but you can also find emf meters that barely work uh, you can Absolutely. find um, uh, different chips and pendants and stickers that and that's a whole another discussion, but that are completely random with claims that are outrageous. You can find, I mean, you find all sorts of things in many product categories. So it's a good reminder that yes, you pay for, you, you kind of get what you pay for, for EMF blocking clothing. And it's true that previously when I started um, writing my book in 2016, it was, you know, the products were not pretty, um, no really real science behind them. So it, it was a bit more exploratory, but now mm -hmm. I think things are getting better and better. And it's good to see a company that is actually testing the products the way that they're going to be used. And that's, that's kind of the, the minimum that should be done. But of course there are marketers that go on the internet and say, Oh, EMF blocking clothing. That's a nice trend. And I see that the, the Google trends is going up or whatever more keyword more, more more searches than ever so let's go ahead and create a company and they create a company they do some drop shipping and they call it a day but uh that's not what you guys have been doing i know that the company has been uh fast growing also and i think that it's it's a mix of you guys know what you're talking about and also you are um every, everywhere when i look at your website and the studies and how you've been doing things uh I think that, you know, what you're claiming and how you're doing things and testing things is, is kind of a different class from most other companies that do the, 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 the clothing really. Well, yeah. It, and, uh, I think the key difference is we were founded by engineers and biologists. Yeah. Uh, and so at the end of the day, you know, we care about the scientific process. Uh, we care about making products that actually work. Um, and. Our very first products were actually not uh, that good looking. Uh, and then we ended up having the former president of Lululemon joining uh, joining us as, a, as an advisor and investor very early on because uh, he believed in the vision that we had of, you know, creating this next generation of clothing that will help people live longer, happier and healthier lives and have the peace of mind of knowing that um, their health is protected from the effect of EMF. And that's when we started really getting clothing that now today is really, really premium quality and, and really great looking. Um, and that respects because there are standards uh, that respect the two standards that that truly matter on the uh, on the EMF protection uh, question too. 
uh, which are um, IEEE 299 and EN 62209. Uh, and no one's going to remember what I just said, but that's fine. <laughs> no, but just understand they're um, tested. And if people visit the website, they can see the test results and the technology. And it's, it's, it's important that you guys are transparent about it. And it's not the case with every company. Uh, some companies have test results and you see them testing a, bu- a, a little like fabric a little bit of fabric and they say, look, our fabric is blocking, but I'm not interested in is the fabric blocking signal because that's easy to do. You ask a lab from China uh, that Mm -hmm. um, manufactures these things to send you the test reports. And that's kind of, okay, yes, but it's a piece of fabric. I want to know, is the boxer functioning to lower exposure in the groin area or else why am I purchasing it, right? Uh, and, And how would you test that at home? It's difficult. In a real it's, world setting, like I would put my EMF meter in my boxers and then see, of course, exactly. a reduction. Yes, but it's more precise when engineers do it. It's much more precise and kind of gives you the peace of mind that, okay, no, the product was in- engineered to do one thing, reduce exposure to the organs, and it does what it's supposed to. So it's, yeah. And and what you said is very important for people who do want to test at home. Well, um, while, as you said, it's it, these type of tests are always uh, better done in a laboratory because they're harder to replicate. But what's important is to understand that all of our products were made to shield the organs and not from keeping radiation from escaping them, which is different. And so if you're putting your cell phone inside of one of our boxers, um, it's kind of a 50-50. It's a ton cost whether you're going to have signal or not. Not because it's a ton cost, the product works, but because it's a ton cost with regards to how uh, strong of a uh, cell uh, of a cell phone signal do you currently have and um, what type of model of cell phone do you have, yeah. uh, and, uh, et cetera. But some might still be able to get reception. That doesn't mean that the technology doesn't work. It's simply because the physics of keeping... EMF inside something, say a microwave, are different from the physics of keeping EMF from entering an area. Uh, and that's what oh, we specialize wow. in. And so if you want to test, it's more effective to indeed put your EMF meter inside of the clothing and then approach the source uh, and then test the same source without the clo- without the lamp's clothing um, than to do the opposite and put your cell phone inside of your clothing and then have the EMF meter uh, on the on the outside, um, but again, we have. I mean, we we, we test all of our uh, clothing and uh, we, we do controlled lab testing, uh, and that's the that's the best way to determine if that if it's if it's working or not. But uh, ultimately, I think it's it's a matter of ethics as well and the type of company that you're trying to that you're trying to build, um, as with. Uh, as with the people who have joined the company, I think they could have done other great things as well. And it's you know not a e-commerce play to try and uh, and, and and make a quick buck on, on on something that is trending. We've been doing this for many 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 years, and what we really care about most is seeing our customers get get results and and feel protected and know that we're delivering on that value proposition. That's that's awesome. I'll, I don't have anything to add. I, I thought it was be it would be 20, 30 minutes, but it was too interesting and we went in for <laughs> hours. So uh, I'm glad we did. And, you know, this is a lot of good content. We talked about fertility. I'm going to have uh, I'm going to pull the studies you talked about and uh, email you if I don't find them, include them in the yep. show notes. We're going to have a link to lambs if you guys want to check the products that are there. I don't even know if we're going to have a coupon code, to be honest. I uh, I, I I haven't been an affiliate for lambs i am affiliated with a lot of products because it's part of how i finance my work but i have not been uh, my work my team is communicating with yours i think so if there's a coupon it's going to be underneath the video but uh even without coupon you know these are premium products uh the boxers are premium they come at a premium price but i think they're gonna be like they're gonna um uh last way longer than my cheap boxers from h m <laughs> right so yeah. uh, how how long do the the boxer last right and maybe the last question before we go would be how can we take care of these premium 
EMF blocking clothing because I know that uh, some people in the past have recommended special soaps or special care. Do you use, you know, the dryer or not? Is there special things we need to know about it? And how long can we really wear wear those clothing uh, for? Yeah, so we did 120 plus different prototypes of the fabric before we landed on this current version. And we actually keep like always working on it to make it, I mean, the, the very, the bulk of these iterations was making something that was radiation blocking and comfortable. Yeah. Uh, but part of it was also about uh, the care. Um, and what we recommend today uh, is wash on cold if possible, and then hang dry. Okay. Uh, that's what's going to extend ex the life, the, the, the life of the products, the, the most. Now, with that being said, uh, we know that the majority of our customers don't listen to that <laughs> actually <laughs> wash on hot and, um, and, air and, and tumble dry. And that's actually how we test, uh, the products, uh, when we do our, our quality testing after every production batch. Uh, we test them with um, washing them hot and then uh, drying them. Um, and we do a number of cycles to make sure that, you know, there is no quality issues uh, with, you know, the garment um, shrinking too much or, I mean, there is always some shrinking that's yeah. going to happen. It's about 7% in our case. Um, but yeah. And then because I mentioned this 42% silver fiber in the garment, what's beautiful about silver fiber is that it is much, much more durable, uh, that most other fibers out there. Um, and so the, uh, the, 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 the boxer should last a good number of years. Uh, I'm still wearing some of my boxers from 2019 and, um, I, you know, I, I'm, fortunate in the sense that I get to test all of our new versions. So, uh, I'm guessing it's funny. I, I can see in my, in my drawer, the evolution <laughs> all the of, different, uh, you have like mm -hmm. an entire history lesson of the company in your, in your box just yeah. to our That's funny. Uh, but even the first ones are still, are still looking pretty good. And as you said before, it's a premium product. It's not just the cashmere price of, uh, the, the, the fabric. Um, it's also that, we pay great attention to every single detail, including the seams, including like all the small details that individually don't seem to matter, but when all put together, make the difference between a cheap boxer or cheap t-shirt and a high quality premium product that feels high quality. And, um, and in order to do that, we actually have a great manufacturing partner uh, where we pay about a 25% premium compared to if we were going trying to go for shoot for the middle middle of the road man, manufacturer uh, so that we can pay ethical wages uh, so that we can offer um uh, so so that we can offer like appropriate time off to the workers and ultimately um have the quality that we have today which i think stems from uh, you know having this sustainable and ethical um manufacturing from the get-go as well well, that speaks to me as well. That's tremendous. I did not know that, know that. So it's good to know that I've been doing things the right way. I usually, you know, do not tumble dry them. Sometimes it happens just by mistake, but usually I, I just hang the, the boxers, uh, the one or two pairs I, I have. And I, I have, I have yet to complete my collection, but I will, when I come back to Montreal and make sure that, um, because I know that these will last for years and maybe they're, they, they are more expensive than my usual boxers, but my usual boxers after a year are torn down and destroyed. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when you buy cheap clothing, you're kind of replacing it two or three or four times as fast. So in the end, you know, it's a, it's a good investment to go with, with the premium if you can afford it, I think. So, uh, Archer, thank you so much for your presence on Smarter Tech. It was highly informative. And, uh, I know that, uh, if people have questions, let's do, uh, and, and, not around a little bit later uh, down the road. Always down for that. Thanks so much for having me, Nick. It was a pleasure talking as always. Thanks again. And, uh, talk next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.